Hi, this is Pastor Daryl Myatt from Keller, Texas. Today is Monday, August 26, 2019. This channel is all about world news, Bible prophecy, end time events, and the return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let's get right into it today. Out of the Times of Israel, three rockets fired at Israel from Gaza, interrupting stereo concert for thousands. Iron Dome intercepts two of the projectiles, several minor in injuries. Rocket sparks fire near highway. Shrapnel hits empty building. Gaza, remember the land that Israel gave up for peace with the Palestinians? That Gaza? You know, Israel kept up their end of the bargain. They gave up the land. Palestinians have not kept up their end of the bargain. There's been nothing but terror coming from Gaza ever since Israel gave it up. Three rockets launched into Israel from Gaza, from Hamas. Keep in mind, the world wants Israel to give up more land for peace because it obviously works really well, right? Out of the Times of Israel, Israel Air Force airstrikes hit Hamas camp in Gaza after three rockets fired into Israel. Israel doesn't stand by and just take a beating. They respond with force. They say, oh, you want to launch rockets into Israel? We're going to wipe you out. Israeli Air Force launched a series of airstrikes on targets in the northern Gaza Strip early today. Hours after Palestinian terrorists fired three rockets at southern Israel, sending thousands of residents rushing to bomb shelters. I've been to Stero, Israel. I've seen the bomb shelters everywhere. They're at the bus stops. They're on schoolyards. They're on playgrounds. They have bomb shelters everywhere because it's necessary. I've seen the police department in Stero where they have rack after rack of exploded rockets that have been fired from Gaza. I've got pictures of it. Go to my Facebook page, look under uh, photos, then click on albums, then look under Israel Ministry Trip, and you'll see in that place there's hundreds of rockets and missiles and bombs that have been launched from Gaza into Israel. I think Israel is about to launch a serious assault into taking out their enemy who keeps doing nothing but launching attacks. And I think it's about time they did. Did you see this? Out of Israel National News, the U.S. State Department removes all mention of Palestinian authority. The word Palestinian Authority and Palestinian Territories no longer appear on official State Department website. The U.S. State Department website has deleted the Palestinian Authority from the list of countries and areas on its website. Until recently, Palestinians appeared on the site under the name Palestinian Authority and before that the Palestinian Territories. But there's been quite a significant devaluation of the Palestinian status on the U.S. side, with the State Department ordering to remove any reference that included the word occupied territories in reference to the Palestinian Arabs. Now the very existence of a Palestinian authority is not present on the official website representing the U.S. State Department. Kind of makes you wonder what this Donald Trump deal of the century, this peace plan, is going to look like coming out. Oh, Less than a month, hopefully. We'll see. After the September 17th Israeli elections, this peace plan should be coming forward. <sighs> Who knows? Out of Haaretz, as Hezbollah leader blasts Israel, Iran-backed militias struck on Iraq-Syria border. Hassan Nasrallah condemns very dangerous escalation and blasts Israeli aggression amid reports of six killed in strike on convoys. Israeli aggression. It's what they're calling these strikes against the enemies that are forming against Israel. Israel has good intelligence. They have people out there. They're Mossad and uh, other factions of Israel. They see what's happening on the ground. And they're not going to allow Iran a foothold to launch a strike against them. It's just, it's very interesting watching these things happen. Because, you know, God tells us in his word 
from long ago, things that will happen in regards to Israel. Jerusalem, those who hate Israel, those who seek to make the name of Israel remembered no more, those who lead armies against Israel, like Ezekiel 38 and 39 speak of. Look at this story out of Haaretz. It says, Israel drawing its last breaths, says Iranian commander behind foiled drone attacks. The chief of Iran's Quds Force, Qasem Soleimani, reacted to, reacting to an Israeli airstrike in Syria and the crash of two Israeli drones in a Beirut suburb, tweeted on Sunday, these were the last struggles of Israel. These insane operations are absolutely the last struggles of the Zionist regime. He said Israel is drawing its last breath. You know... Ezekiel told us in Ezekiel 38 and Ezekiel 39 that Persia, which is modern-day Iran, will lead a world army against Israel. It will happen, because God's word said it would, because God knows the end from the beginning. And I think God tells us these things, not only so that we'll know kind of the events that will happen, the things that will happened prior to the return of Christ, but also so God can make us know absolutely without a doubt that he alone is God, because he knew what would happen from the beginning. He knew. Um, but you can take comfort in knowing how God responds to this world army coming against Israel. In Ezekiel 39, verse 4, Thou shalt fall upon the mountains of Israel, Thou and all thy bands, and the people that is with thee, I will give thee unto the ravenous birds of every sort, and to the beasts of the field to be devoured. So the birds and the beasts are going to eat these enemies of God. Thou shalt fall upon the open field, for I have spoken it, said the Lord God, and I will send a fire on Magog, and among them that dwell carelessly in the isles, and they shall know that I am the Lord. So will I make my holy name known in the midst of my people Israel. You hear that? My people Israel. And I will not let them pollute my holy name any more. and the heathen shall know that I am the Lord, the Holy One in Israel. All of this will happen. And it happens for a reason, and it's another case of something that looks horrible being used by God. Like Romans 8, 28 tells us, For we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. This too, even though it looks like a horrible war, a terrible human catastrophe, many lost lives, I can tell you why it happens. Because God tells us in Ezekiel 39, verse 22, exactly why this all happens. So the house of Israel shall know that I am the Lord their God from that day and forward. Mm. Don't you love being a child of the Most High? being a son of the creator of all things. Out of the Times of Israel, Netanyahu says, states hosting Iranian attacks on Israel will bear the consequences. Yeah. I wonder if he knows how biblically correct he is. The Bible tells us the, the ravenous birds and the beasts of the field will devour their flesh. Hmm. That's the fate awaiting those who come against Israel. Out of the Christian Post, 40 Christians on pilgrimage attacked by suspected Hindu radicals in India simply because they were Christians. Christians being attacked, persecuted, and killed all over the world simply for their faith in Christ. This will come to a city near you, no matter where you live, it will happen eventually. 
People like me who proclaim Christ is the only way to God the Father will be thrown in jail, will be told to shut up, or will be executed for their faith in Christ. I say bring it. <laughs> Not afraid. Uh, the Bible speaks of why fear the one that can kill the body and then do no more. Rather fear him who can cast the soul into hell. That would be God. Fear God. Don't worry about what man might do to you. We need to make sure we rely on the Holy Spirit of God as we seek to serve him, as we seek to do kingdom work while we're still here on earth. In Ezra 4, starting in verse 1, it says, Now, when the adversaries of Judah and Benjamin heard that the children of the captivity builded the temple unto the Lord God of Israel, then they came to Zerubbabel, and to the chief of the fathers, and said unto them, Let us build with you, for we seek your God as you do. And we do sacrifice unto him since the days of Esahadon, king of Assur, which brought us up here. But Zerubbabel and Jeshua and the rest of the chief of the fathers of Israel said unto them, You have nothing to do with us to build a house unto our God. But we ourselves together will build unto the Lord God of Israel, asking Cyrus, the king of Persia, hath commanded us. Then the people of the land weakened the hands of the people of Judah and troubled them in building and hired counselors against them to frustrate their purpose all the days of Cyrus, king of Persia, even until the reign of Darius, king of Persia. See, Israel's enemies were clever enough in their attempt to stop the temple's reconstruction. Not unlike today, where there's so many who are seeking to keep Israel from building the third temple that we know will come. It will be there, because the Bible speaks expressly of it. Revelation 11, verses 1 and 2, John was taken in spirit and shown that temple, told to measure the temple, but to leave out the outer courts, because it would be trampled on by the Gentiles for three and a half years, which is the exact length of the Great Tribulation. 2 Thessalonians 2, verses 3 and 4, Paul tells us that this son of perdition, the one we refer to as the Antichrist, will make his appearance there, claiming to be God. You see, God never has to say, I am God, worship me. Because everyone knows the power of God. The Bible says that every knee will bow. Every knee will bow. You see, when you're in the presence of the Almighty, you can't help but to fall on the ground because of the power, the majesty, the splendor that is above and beyond anything else we've ever comprehended. You realize in that moment how completely subservient we are. There's no way you can stand in the presence of the Almighty God. Only an imposter, only a fake, only a counterfeit would have to say, Hey, I'm God, worship me. Because with the real God, we'll already know. <laughs> Here Israel's enemies tried to stop them from rebuilding the temple. At first they offered to help. I mean, what better way to make things go wrong than to get involved in the work? You know, the devil infiltrates the church. When their assistance was rejected, they set out to discourage the workers and make them even afraid. They even hired counselors to stop the Israelites, and they were successful in slowing down the project, but not stopping it completely. You know, God wanted his people to reject self-reliance and instead carry out his work in dependence upon the Holy Spirit. He offered them encouragement. He protected their building project despite this huge mountain of opposition that came up against them. I mean, sometimes this means that he'll remove the problem. Other times he is right there and guides us through it. He walks with us right through it. But... Either way, we are to rely steadily on God's Holy Spirit. And when you do this, it helps you to patiently love your spouse when there is trouble in the home, 
when there's a disagreement or a problem that comes up. Trusting God's Holy Spirit will help us to wisely guide our children toward godliness in this self-centered world we live in. It will help us to follow scriptural principles about giving, about saving, about spending in, in a world that tells us to get what we want and get it right now. When you rely on God's Holy Spirit, you will experience contentment and God's peace in your current circumstance, no matter what you're going through, whether you're single or married, employed, rich, poor, healthy or sick, no matter what, you'll find contentment through God's Holy Spirit. And then we'll do God's work His way instead of our way. We don't rely upon ourselves. We rely upon Him. Being led by the Holy Spirit characterizes how we work. You know, and that kind of mindset is, is counterculture to this world and to the flesh. Galatians 5.16, it's the only way to live as a child of God. It's the only way to be a humble servant. It's the only way to daily take up your cross and follow after him. We need to seek out believers who are trying to practice dependence on the Holy Spirit and encourage one another to not give up, no matter what problems arise, no matter what tries to stop us. In 1 Peter, 1 Peter 3, verse 9, it says, Not rendering evil for evil, or railing for railing, but contrarywise, blessing, knowing that you are therefore called, that you should inherit a blessing. You know, I once heard this story about the power of blessing another person. There was a young professor who, who went to, uh, I think it was Gatlinburg, Tennessee. And he was in a cafe where this white-haired old man was pouring coffee for all the people in there. And the old man told a story to a group of people about a little boy who didn't have a dad. The old man said, some called him illegitimate. Some called him even worse. And the boy was ashamed. He kept mostly to himself. And no one would ask him about his father. Well, one day a new preacher came to the church. And a little boy got caught in the preacher's greeting line. And when the preacher shook the little boy's hand, he said, So, son, whose boy are you? And a hush kind of fell over the crowd. And everybody was like, ooh. Well, this preacher saw the pain in the little boy's eyes. And he said, oh, I recognize you. You're a child of God, and you have a great inheritance, son, so go out and claim it for yourself. Well, that little boy, he grew up and he had a great life, all because some preacher believed in him and spoke some words of encouragement over him. When the old man walked away from this group of people, the professor asked the waitress, said, hey, who is that man? The waitress said, well, that's, that's Ben Hooper, the former governor of Tennessee. And he was that young boy without a dad. Ben Hooper became the governor of Tennessee that day. The preacher blessed him with those words. You know, God is waiting for us to bless someone in our lives. Just a little word of encouragement might go a lot farther than you think. So don't be afraid to share with somebody a little word, some kindness, some encouragement, giving some strength to somebody who may not have any of their own. In Luke 11, verse 11, it says, If a son shall ask bread of any of you that is a father, will he give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish, will he give him a serpent, or if he shall ask an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? You know, the most loving Father in the world can't compare to our heavenly Father and the love he has for us. I have to say, I've got a great dad. 
My mom and dad are both still alive. Um, they live about 10 minutes from me. I am blessed to be able to see them <laughs> when my work schedule permits. Um, they've been married, my goodness, what is it now? Some 60, 61 years? I can barely keep up with my own. But I've been blessed in the Lord. God has blessed me with a great God-fearing dad and a God-honoring mother. <laughs> I mean, my dad was my best man at my wedding some 30 years ago simply because he's the best man I know. But at times we find it easier to believe in the willingness of a father or mother or our mate to help us more than we are in the willingness of God to use his power on our behalf, right? I think very few people really doubt God's ability, but instead it's our doubt of his willingness to use his ability on our behalf that causes most people to do without, right? Jesus said, Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all these other things will be added unto you. So I think it's about where we place our importance. What do you put the most importance on? God should be first and foremost at the top of the list. Seeking his kingdom. Seeking to share the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ with as many as we'll hear. Jesus is assuring us that God loves us. And he's willing to demonstrate that love. And it's far greater of a love than we can ever experience in any human relationship. No matter how great your father or mother might be, the Lord didn't just save us out of pity or a sense of obligation as our creator. He saved us because he loved us, John 3.16. It was the good pleasure of his will for us to become adopted sons, Ephesians 1, verse 5. We were wanted and accepted by the creator of all things, our heavenly father. That's, that's a wonderful promise. You know, it's more than any of us deserve to be forgiven by God than to be given certain rights and privileges would have been more than we could have ever expected. But the Lord even went further than that. He's actually accepted us. He's grafted us into the family. He's adopted us as sons and daughters for those who know Christ as Lord and Savior. The dictionary defines the word accept as to receive gladly or to receive into a place or a group. You know, the Lord doesn't just tolerate us. He actually loves us. He even likes us. And he rejoices over us with joy, according to Zephaniah 3, verse 17. So keep that in mind. The next time you feel beaten down or depressed or sad over something, God loves you. He'll never leave you. He'll never forsake you. And he will strengthen you if you just rely upon him. Ask him to fill you with his spirit. Ask him to give you wisdom and guidance and discernment that you may be able to lead his people. That should be your prayer. I love you guys. God bless you. Good Lord willing. I'll see you again tomorrow.